You can't focus on Scott anymore, honey. He's 24 years old, Marjorie. Let that fucking bird fly, please. Don't worry, Mom. I know your daughter got smart and went to college and abandoned us. But I'm still here. I'm gonna be here forever. Yeah. You ever think about putting on the jacket? Why would you even ask me that? What's wrong with being a fireman? It's fine if you don't have kids, because you don't know if you're gonna come home or not, and then your kids are fucked up. You make everyone around you feel crazy. People are normal, then they hang out with you, and then they're fucking Jack Nicholson in The Shining or something. I just feel like everybody's always disappointed in me, and I never live up to anybody's expectations. Hey, thanks for listening to all this. You're one of the few people who treat me, you know, like a person. You're welcome. Yeah, man, that was a clip from a movie I just watched, The King of Staten Island. Uh, that's coming out tomorrow on Netflix that I suggest all of you watch. Um, and we have uh, the director, producer, and writer of the film. But I'm going to let DB, who hasn't been on the show in quite some time, do the honors and introduce our guests. Go ahead, DB. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. you know him from movies such as 40-Year-Old Virgin, Knocked Up, Funny People, This Is 40. Of course, Trainwreck with a- uh, Amy Schumer, which is where I believe uh, when he first worked with uh, Bill Burr, and then he got introduced through Amy Schumer to the star of his new film, Pete Davidson. Please welcome back Judd Apatow. Judd, Judd, hey. Judd! Big round of applause, Judd! Good to be here. The movie, though, is not on Netflix. I think it's on everything but Netflix. It's, really? It's a, it's a rental. So if you just, like, scream at your computer, like, show me King of Staten <laughs> Island, it will, it will just appear. <laughs> uh, so it's on YouTube, Red, so Amazon? It's, a, it's Amazon. It's Google. It's, I mean, it's, I, it might be on Shudder, Criterion. I don't know. It's every. You just, just turn on the computer and scream, Siri, Alexa, where is it? It'll come yeah, up. It, it, it'll come up, man. All right. Okay, cool, man. It's a powerful movie, Judd. I want to get into it. Uh, but how you been, man? The, the country isn't the same since last time we spoke. I know. It's, uh, I mean, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's such a strange time, but I, I'm trying to look at it as a hopeful time, as a time where conversations are happening that should have been happening all along. And just the fact that there's movement is, is, is a really good thing. And we just have to keep the energy up. And there's a big election and a real opportunity to get rid of a lot of bad people. So we, we have to all register and, and fight voter suppression. Absolutely, man. Have you, um, and, and that's, that's kind of an ongoing thing we've been having. Yeah, we've been seeing voter uh, suppression already in, in, in Georgia and in other places. Um, and, and I'm sure you've been on cue with it. I remember reading something recently that you said sometimes funny isn't the point. There are times when I think conditions are so serious that comedy, comedy does not accomplish what we want it to. And so with all these recent issues in the country, how has that affected you as a filmmaker and knowing when a joke is helpful or, or hurtful? Because your movie is always funny but thoughtful at the same time. Right. You know, you know, this movie, a lot of it is about mental health issues. It's about how Pete Davidson dealt with the trauma of losing his dad, who was a firefighter who died in 9-11. And even though it's a fictional story, it, it's based on all the emotions that his family has gone through and the struggles that, that he's had. And I think, you know, comedy and drama are a helpful part of how we process things. But there's definitely moments when I'm, you know, reading and I think there's no purpose for comedy right now. There's no reason to make it lighter. There's no reason to you know, try to find anything entertaining in this because there's such important things that need to be fought for that you know, sometimes it's okay to see a funny monologue that explains things, but there's a lot of other times where we should just be very serious and, and try to figure out like what is the action plan here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you feel like the, this is one of those times? Oh, absolutely, because it's so easy in our country, which has no attention span, for uh, people to just move on. And that mm-hmm. is what you know most of the power structure in the country wants to do. They just pray that people don't stay focused on this and they can move on and not really do the things that are, are, are essential at this moment. Uh, Judd Apatow is with us right now. Uh, Pete Davidson, man, uh, 
This dude really blew me away um, in, with his acting chops in this particular movie. I mean, I know he's done projects before, but this, this movie to me is one of those uh, standout performances for him. Uh, did he have any reservations about doing this movie at all? I know he wanted to tell his story. Or, uh, I know it's loosely based on his life, but were there, were there any moments where he just kind of had to stop down and just have a surreal moment like, damn, I'm reliving something that happened to me in real life during the shooting? I think, I think that it was probably scariest for him right before we started shooting. You know, the weekend before we started shooting, he started sending me uh, emails with the uh, – IMDB resumes of other actors he thought would be better playing him. And he just kept sending me links to Emil Hirsch or Daniel Radcliffe or just over and over again, log lists, like, this guy would be better, this guy would be better. And I thought he was joking. And then the next day, I was like, that was so funny. He's like, I wasn't kidding at all. I was hoping you would just hire somebody. Uh, because, you know, he's facing the, you know, the hardest stuff, it's, you know, his grief and his loss. And he's turned it into art, and I think it's a really generous gift to people because most people don't have the ability to share this kind of thing. It's just too intimate and personal. But it is so helpful to see a movie that's dramatic and funny that talks about something that we all go through. We all have these losses in our lives. Absolutely. Um, your daughter um, is in this movie as well. Uh, she plays uh, Pete's mod is in it. She plays Claire. Uh, you work with your family members a lot, and it does. I mean, that, do y'all find a way to divide or separate home life from work life? Is it all? Or is it all intertwined? Is it just look, hey man, it's all it's all coming to the same pot, so we got to deal with it at home, or you know what I mean? Like it, the money comes to the same pot. Right. I mean, how, how, <laughs> I know sometimes I, I I just I go you you pay for it, you pay for lunch. How <laughs> <laughs> um, well, treat I think, me? I think part of it is like I feel like a lot of the work. Is, is strong when, you know, some of the people in it are your friends or your family. Like Ricky Velez plays Pete's best friend in the movie. Uh, and his other friend in it is Derek Gaines. And those are his two best friends in life. And so in the movie, they're better because of it. They're funny. They have a shorthand. They have history. And, you know, Maude's been on Euphoria and the TV show Hollywood on Netflix. And she's so strong now that I just try to stay out of the way. I mean, now I can only mm -hmm. screw her up. <laughs> <laughs> Judd, that makes everything that you say makes sense. I'm wondering how you also make space for in these conversations around Hollywood of diversity, because I totally understand wanting to um, be in movies, do films with people that you love already personally and professionally and that you know can kill it, but then also leaving room for newcomers and giving them a try. How do you find that balance? I, I think that it's really... You know, meeting people and helping them tell their stories. So obviously, when someone like me starts out, I'm mainly telling my story, you know, which is me, white Jewish guy from Long Island. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's populated for a while. And then, you know, when I started working with Lena Dunham, uh, you know, we really tried to work on something which was, you know, very female-focused. And there hadn't been a TV show like that before a very, very brutally honest comedy with a female showrunner uh, and a female star and director. And then, you know, when I met Kamel Nanjiani and Emily and we talked about The Big Sick, to me that was an exciting thing to do. And we worked on it for years. Nobody gave us any money to develop it. It wasn't like the world was screaming for that movie. We, we, we just did it ourselves. We invested in it ourselves and we... Someone, uh, Film Nation invested $5 million to make the movie. And then we tried to sell it to uh, the studios. And most of them said no. They really didn't think that people would go. And then Lionsgate and Amazon bought it. And it was a big hit. But I think the, you know, the racism in Hollywood was the belief that the big sick wouldn't make money. Uh -huh. That people wouldn't want to see a, a, a story about you know, a family of immigrants. And that's what's wrong with Hollywood, and that's what has to change. And we try to do it by looking for people who have great stories. Let me ask you this. Um, when you bring it up, Hollywood, I know I've been hearing about move, a lot of movies like Gone with the Wind and others being removed from streaming services because of the racial depiction of black characters. Uh, do you think that's a great idea? you think or a knee-jerk reaction to what's going on right now? 
I, I, I understand that side of things. I don't have a strong opinion about it. I could go either way, honestly, about the removal of things. You know, do we remove the Kevin Spacey movies? He's in every movie on Earth. Do we remove them? You know, what do we do with the Cosby show? Is it something that should be out there or not out there? And for me, that's not kind of what I care about. I think what, what we need is to vote people out who uh-huh. are racists. I think we need to vote people out who don't care about other people, who only care about corporations. I think that when we have better government, we can pass more laws that help people. And right now, uh, you know, we don't control the Senate, so we can't get anything done. So we've got to kick out all those bad Republican senators who prevent anything positive from happening. Uh, John Apatow is with us, um, and uh, DB is online right now. He got a question. If you want to question him, to a 888-742-3345. DB. Hey, Judd. How's it going? Um, I watched the movie last night, and you guys were lucky enough to uh, finish filming this before the entire COVID-19 coronavirus stuff started uh, spreading. And uh, for all the movies that aren't finished that have to delay shooting or postpone uh, finishing their films, I'm reading a lot about having to put these uh, precautionary measures in place, some uh, rumors about uh, adding to studio budgets, uh, coronavirus protection for the employees, the cast and the crew. So what are you hearing around Hollywood as far as what can be done moving forward as far as keeping uh, all the employees safe and, and that sort of thing? I think they just put out a list of protocols they expect people uh, to take to keep people safe. We were about to start a movie with Billy Eichner in Buffalo when this all began that we had to shut down. I'm very nervous about it. I don't want anyone to ever be unsafe. And if you've ever worked on a movie, there's a fair amount of people on the crew who are not healthy. There are some people who are not in tip-top shape. And the idea of... uh, something like COVID moving through a, 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 a film shoot is very, very scary. And I don't know how you do scenes with the actors. I mean, actors are like nose to nose all day long. You know, we have a lot of scenes with big crowds. You couldn't shoot an enormous amount of the scenes in the King of Staten Island. Are they going to use special lenses to make it look like people are closer together in the frame than they are? Are they going to CGI plates? Uh, to make it look like there's a lot of people in the crowd if you need to be in, a, in, a, in an auditorium in a scene. I think that it's going to be very expensive and very tricky until there's medicine that makes this a lot uh, less dangerous. Hmm. You, you talk about Staten Island, man. I, you know, I, the, 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 the times I've been to Staten Island is uh, – to go visit like the Wu-Tang Clan or something, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like, that's a good reason. Know, yeah, yeah, you know, so I, I went into their neighborhood and, and it had some interesting experiences over there, to say the least, Judge. You could make a movie about <laughs> yeah. the days I spent in Staten Island, but I, I really didn't know the stigma of Staten Island until I was watching this movie and it, it seems uh, when, when Peach character Scott is hanging around his crew and they're talking about, uh, you know, his, the girl plays Kel- Kelsey, um, his girlfriend is talking about, you know, nobody ever comes to Staten Island. Nobody from <laughs> any of the boroughs ever come to Staten Island. You know, this is like they even said, Heather, Staten Island is one step below New Jersey. <laughs> Listen, don't try to drag wow. Jersey in it, Judd. I have listen. Hey, Judd, what's up? It's Heather B. How you doing? I would have no Jersey slander swag. You better yeah, but be easy. It, 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 no, it's in the script. I'm saying it's in the movie. <laughs> Judd wrote that. <laughs> Judd, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know what's so funny though just Staten Island is literally a bridge away like from New Jersey so we're in certain parts of Jersey and I'm from that area where we just go over literally what you would call a Bayonne Bridge and right into another bridge we can be in Staten Island in no time flat and yet you don't go yeah, we don't yeah. go. <laughs> so, so, so is that is that something Pete wanted to make sure, like, was noted that you know people don't go to Staten Island? What what is that about? I see, I'm from Cali originally. I don't I don't know that part. What is that about? Well, I think what, what's interesting about Staten Island is unless you have friends there, you know, like the Wu Tang mm-hmm. Clan or relatives, there's really no reason to go there unless you live there because there's no Six Flags Staten Island. There's no amazing like theater that you have to see a show at. 
There's no cultural thing taking that forces you to go there. So mm-hmm. I from Long, Long Island. I didn't step on, step foot on Staten Island till we started making the movie, and it's very much like Long Island. I I felt I was very comfortable there, and everyone was really cool, and we had a great time. But it is almost like its own little bubble. And Pete talked mm-hmm. a lot about when he was a kid that even though the city was like right there and you saw it all day long, he would go like once a year as a kid <laughs> to the city. It was like it was on the other side of the country. But I, I mean, Pete really, um, for the namesake of this movie, is I, I would imagine people really see him as the king of Staten Island now with all the success he's had. Uh, I'm curious to what were some of the challenges you guys have filming on Staten Island, you know, like with paparazzi and people not really seeing that kind of activity on the island. What kind of challenges did y'all face? You know, zero. Everybody was very cool. And, you know, only one paparazzi came, Steve Sands. He would show up every day. Just one guy. And, just one guy? And that was it. And whenever we were in a neighborhood, everyone was pretty thrilled that we were there. I think the city's a little harder to shoot in because there's just so many people there. Mm-hmm. But on Staten Island, it, it, it was pretty chill. See, being so close, living in Jersey, Jersey City in particular, being so close to Staten Island, thank God for Wu-Tang. I didn't know there were even black people in Staten Island until Wu-Tang came out. Like, it literally had, um, <laughs> there was a stigma on Staten Island. You know, we just didn't go. And, and I knew more black people in Long Island, which is much further um, than Staten, you know, than Staten Island. So it was just not a place that we frequented and not a place that, we we went to so you know yeah sway you said it earlier thank god for woo you know because otherwise we just didn't go it was a place that we drove through to get to queens or to get to to, to brooklyn or someplace else yeah but we well there's that amazing through. documentary about wu-tang clan on i think it's on showtime mm-hmm. it's like a six-hour documentary which is awesome and I, I i've worked with three of those guys rizza was in oh. funny people ghostface mm-hmm. was in uh walk hard and Method Man was in Trainwreck. So I'm, I'm right. working my way through the, the entire the, group. The nine members. <laughs> yo, 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 Judd, you're a Wu-Tang fan, huh? You know, I've spent more personal time with them than most people. I can say that. I've spent uh, intimate comedy time with RZA, talking comedy with RZA, and he was hysterical. So uh-huh. funny. <laughs> Wow, man. Uh, Judd Apatow is on, and we're talking about the King of Staten Island. Um, it's out tomorrow. If you want to talk with him, 888-742-3345. We got um, Ant Dog on the line from Virginia. Ant, Ant what up? Dog. Ant Dog. <laughs> hey, 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 what's happening, the crew? What up with you, what man? I, 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 good morning, Judd. I'm a, I'm a fan of your work, man. I'm calling, I'm calling for my son. He's uh, 25. And in the military, but he's he's wanting to get out to get in the film. He's always wanted to get in the film. So I was just wondering if you had any advice for him. You know, it's interesting you say that because years ago I was at this event and I think it was General McChrystal, but I could be wrong because I get, I get them confused sometimes. And he was talking about how the Easter Seals people have this program where they help people from the military get jobs on movie sets. And uh-huh. that was about seven years ago. And so we hooked up with them. And on every movie and TV show we've done, we've used veterans to work on our set and BPAs and work in the camera department. And it's been a kind of an amazing uh, program to work with. So you, maybe you want to, like, hunt that down. I mean, I don't have anything in production now because I don't know when that will be. But this program was great. And everyone in it kicked ass. And they definitely have okay. found a way to, to funnel people into Hollywood productions. All right. Hey, Ant Dog, thanks for calling in, bro. You a citizen, man. That's my in the morning, bro. Right. His name is Ant Dog, y'all. I like it. Ant <laughs> Dog. BP, where Aunt you at? Ant Dog. <laughs> hey, hey Judd, uh, this, this is uh, kind of a long, so just stick with me here. But um, obviously the public opinion of the police department is shifting uh, a lot because of all the events that have happened. And I saw somebody post something that said uh, police have been scrutinized for so long because NWA never made a song called Fuck the Fire Department. And this movie is almost like painting the fire department as such, uh, uh, you know, that they're heroes. They, they do the job that nobody wants. And Steve Buscemi, a lot of people don't know that he was actually a fireman uh, before he became an actor. And 
So it, it's almost like as much as this is about Pete's life and, and, and his struggle, did you inadvertently or was it also sort of like putting that in the movie about the, the hard job that firemen and, and their, their, their view or how, pe- how people view firemen uh, in public opinion? Well, here's the thing. I, you know, in my life, I probably never thought much about firefighters. Uh, I think after 9-11, we were all aware of the courage of our first responders and their willingness to put themselves at, at risk and pay the ultimate price for doing that. Uh, but I hadn't ever been around firefighters. I didn't know any firefighters, and I learned about this through Pete. And it is an amazing community of people uh, who've just decided that they – want to spend their lives putting themselves at risk to save other people. And they're really amazing, beautiful people. I said to this one guy, isn't it boring most of the time? Like most of the calls are kind of lame. It's just someone tripped or someone's cat got lost. And the guy said, you know what, Jed, I know it sounds corny, but we just like helping people. And I really believe that to be true. And they love the job. They don't want to retire. They, they really love the lifestyle of being a firefighter. Hmm. It's a great movie. Uh, congratulations on it. And um, I'm sure we'll talk to Pete, too. But the entire cast, I really felt like I was in Staten Island and kind of got a, a pulse of what it's like to grow up there. You know, and uh, everybody killed the accent, by the way. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Especially Belle Pauly, who has the best accent. She plays the love interest. Yeah. And she's from London. And she smoked everybody on the accent. Oh, she's from London? Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah, she did, man. Congratulations, another one, Judd. And looking Thank forward you. to talking to you in person once we get through all of these things, okay? Absolutely. Be well. Take care, everybody. You too, Judd. Okay.